Welcome to Black Sheep, where I take a look at entries in video game franchises that were poorly received or controversial among the fans. Now I won't be dwelling on the negative aspects of these games. Instead, I will be looking in detail at the things I liked about the games, whether it was the story, gameplay, music, or anything else it contained, and see if they're really deserving of the infamy that they have. For this episode, we will be looking at Alone in the Dark, 2008. Alone in the Dark is one of the oldest survival horror series in gaming. It's actually often considered the grandfather of the genre, as its influence could be seen in horror games for years to come. It had revolutionary visuals and mechanics for its time, and received two sequels in the 90s, and a fourth title, Alone in the Dark, A New Nightmare, in 2001. After a several year hiatus, a new entry into the series was released in 2008. Published by Atari and developed by Eden Games, this new chapter into the franchise was simply called Alone in the Dark. The game's story is told through television-style episodes, even including previously on Alone in the Dark segments. Players can skip to any chapter of any episode that they wish, but as someone who likes to play games from start to finish, I never really use this feature that much. In this story, you play as Edward Carnby, one of the protagonists from the original Alone in the Dark games. After waking up in a New York skyscraper, Edward has no memory of who he is or how he came to be there. My God, who the hell am I? After a pretty cool opening sequence, Edward meets up with Sarah, an art dealer who ends up tagging along with Edward for the rest of the game, and Theophile Paddington, an elderly man who seems to know Edward as well as what is behind all the crazy stuff that is happening around them. After escaping the crumbling city streets, Edward arrives at Central Park where a majority of the game takes place. Throughout the hellish night, Edward learns more about what is going on as well as his true identity. This Edward is the same Edward Carnby from the 1920s of the original game, and has remained young by possessing the fabled Philosopher's Stone. In this story, the stone is actually one half of the key needed to release Lucifer back into the mortal realm. Lightbringer? I wonder, did you ever take Latin? I remember this much. Light is Lucis, and to bring is Pharaoh. So, Lightbringer is actually Lucifer. Are you suggesting that this is all about Satan making a comeback? That's what he said, isn't it? The light bringer and a prophecy about the stone. By following the path of light, the two halves can be reunited, allowing one to help or hinder the Prince of Darkness's return. The core storyline of Alone in the Dark is actually quite interesting. However, it does suffer from poor writing. The dialogue isn't the greatest in many of the cutscenes, and the coarse language can be unintentionally humorous at points. I don't have your stone, and f you anyway. What the f? Why did he do that? Oh, I think I'm gonna be f this. What the hell is that? Also, the game's two endings aren't really satisfying either, which is a shame because the build-up in the game's finale is actually quite good. Overall, the story isn't one of the best you'll find in the survival horror genre, but it still does have some pretty great moments. Alone in the Dark's most unique aspect is its gameplay. Over the course of the game, you will drive cars, solve puzzles, craft impromptu weapons, and use the game's impressive fire effects to your advantage. Fire actually plays a large role in this game, as most of the enemies you encounter can only be defeated by fire-based weapons. The fire effects were quite stunning back in 2008, and I would argue that they are still some of the best I've seen in a video game. 
Alone in the Dark had a lot of ambitious ideas, like making your characters have to close their eyes to solve certain puzzles. Some of these gameplay systems can be tricky to use, like the analog-controlled melee weapons, but some, like the environmental weapons and crafting system, are good fun. Molotov, cocktails, fire bullets, and sticky bombs are just a few of the combinations you can make. There's just something immensely satisfying about stumbling across a can of bug spray and being able to use it as a miniature flamethrower. The healing system is also pretty neat, as it allows you to spray cuts and wounds Edward has obtained throughout the night. The skin patches can sometimes look a bit goofy, but generally the effect works pretty well. The final main aspect of the game is the cars. From episode 2 onwards, you will have sections where you have to drive vehicles. Sometimes you have to locate a hidden car key, or you can just hotwire the car. But once you get the engine running, it makes getting around Central Park a whole lot easier. The driving controls pale in comparison to the likes of Gran Turismo or Forza. That being said, this game does contain one of my favorite driving segments in any game. Even with the loose controls, driving through the crumbling streets of New York in Episode 2 of this game is super cool, and it is made even more so by one of this game's strongest points, the music. Alone in the Dark soundtrack is definitely unique. A majority of these tracks include the group The Mystery of Bulgarian Voices, and these vocals add a very eerie and sometimes intense feeling to the atmosphere. Tracks like Who Am I and An End for a Prelude are unlike anything else I've heard in a game, and help support Alone in the Dark in some of its biggest moments. The instrumental music is also quite good, like the unnerving scales heard in the early parts of the game, and the more subtle pieces while exploring the ruins of Central Park. Even though it was a bit of a commercial success, Alone in the Dark was critically panned upon its initial release. The fixed camera, slippery controls, and game-breaking bugs made for many frustrated gamers. Atari and Eden Games remedied this in the PS3 version of the game, Alone in the Dark Inferno, which included reworked controls, a fully controllable camera, and an extra gameplay section. But unfortunately, the original Xbox 360 and PC versions of the game received no such update. Sadly, this soured many people's view of the franchise, and we wouldn't see another Alone in the Dark game until 2015. Alone in the Dark Illumination, a multiplayer shooter of all things, was even more of a critical flop, and has been labeled by many as one of the worst games of last year. Despite this, I am hopeful that we will one day see another new entry in this franchise. While the original games may not look impressive by today's standards, they did introduce many features that would become mainstays of the genre. Alone in the Dark is a game with a great amount of flaws, but there are parts of it that make it seem like it could have been something truly great, and that's why every now and then, I come back to it. I may not be a fan of certain aspects of it, but what the game does right, I absolutely love. It's a survival horror adventure that's quite different from most out there, and hopefully this unique identity will return one day in a new Alone in the Dark game that can be enjoyed by all. Thank you for watching this episode of Black Sheep. What are your thoughts on Alone in the Dark? Any other Black Sheep games you want me to take a look at? Feel free to share in the comments below. Until next time, keep having great adventures, everyone!